Sorry, I had to resituate the camera. We're in chapter 15 of My Teacher Glows in the Dark. I can find it. That's 14. Wow. Here we go. Chapter 15 Brains in a Bottle. When I woke up, Hulan was staring at me anxiously. How did you do that? He asked. Do what? I asked, still feeling groggy. You were inside my head. I could feel it. I want to know how you did it. I blinked. I didn't even know how I did it. I mumbled, too confused to remember the dream. Oh, no, no, no. That was wrong. I didn't even know I did did it. I mumbled, too confused to remember the dream I had had while I was unconscious. I did notice that my words were slurred and slow. Was I all right? I couldn't tell. Peter, talk to me, said Hulan urgently. Let the boy be, ordered Croc Doc. He's been through a lot. Am I... Did you... How did it go? I asked, finally getting the words right. It's hard to say, replied Croc Doc, looking at me with the huge eyes. We have, run, we have to run an intense analysis on the data I uncovered. I did manage to get this, he said, proudly holding up a clear container. Inside the container was a brain. My brain! I screamed. You took off my brain! I tried to grab for my head, but my hands were tied down. Well, yes, but just for a while, said Croc Doc. I'm going to put it back when I'm done. I had tried to jump off the table when I first saw the bottle with my brain in. That failed completely, either because I was tied down or simply had no control over my muscles at the moment. Just as well, since it wouldn't have been a good idea for me to go running around with any brains, although I knew a lot of people back on Earth who did it all the time. I took a deep breath, trying to calm down. I took a lot of deep breaths before it did any good. How come I can see? I whispered when I thought that I had some control over myself. Oh, your brain is still hooked into your head, said Croc Donk, holding up a little bottle again. He gestured to the bottle of it. Bottom of it. See all these wires? They run into your skull, providing nerve attachments. I'll unplug them whenever you're going to do some work that might be uncomfortable for you. I'll unplug them whenever we're going to do some work that might be uncomfortable for you. But in the meantime, you can finally join us here in the world of the waking. Finally, I murmured. How long have I been unconscious? About ten days, Earth time, said Hulan. More than a week, I cried. They haven't done anything to Earth yet, have they? No, no, all action is postponed pending analysis of your brain. Typical of my life, in most of the stories I've read, the fate of the world is in the hero's hand. In my case... The fate of the world was somewhere in my brains. Maybe in my temporal lobes, or my corpus callosum, or medulla oblongata. I learned those. Wherever they, fi wherever they finally found what they were looking for. Or didn't find it, since there was no guarantee that the answer was in my brain. Just a possibility. A buzzer sounded from the ceiling. Croc Doc pushed a button. What is it? he asked. Oh, no. What is it? May we come in? I thought I recognized the voice, but I couldn't be certain, since I was still feeling kind of groggy. Would I ever feel alert again, or was I doomed to a life of permanent mental fuzz? The worst thing was, in my cur current condition, I didn't really care. I couldn't even make myself care. I wondered vaguely if this was what it was like to be hooked on drugs. Do you feel like having visitors? asked Croc Doc. Why not? I said. Though, to tell you the truth, I really didn't care all that much at this point. And once, Fleef and Girk stepped through the wall. Oh my, said Fleef when she saw me strapped to the table with my brain sitting on the counter, on the counter next to me. Her face turned a deep shade of orange and the sphere on the stalk on her skull went, Neep! Neep! How are you, Krepta? Asked Girk, His big eyes seemed filled with worry. Okay, sort of. I said. We've been worried about you, said Fleef. Everyone is very impressed with how brave you are. Does that mean you don't want to blow up Earth anymore? It means I hope we don't have to, replied Fleef, squeezing my hand. I was disappointed. 
On the other hand, I suppose being a good guy about all this didn't really reduce the possible menace of my plan. I sighed. We brought you something, said Gert, trying to sound cheerful. He held up a bag. Do you want to see? I tried to nod, but nod, but couldn't, because my head was strapped down. Sure, I said. Let's see. He, worked, he reached into the bag and pulled out a blob of fur. What is it? I asked. It's a skimmel, said Flea. She sounded very pleased. Girk held out the thing in front of my face. It was about six inches across, round, and red, which made it look like something look something like a big furry ladybug. After a moment, two stalks rose out of the fur. The eyes on the ends of them looked at me and blinked. They're squishy, said Girk, and almost indestructible, see? With that, he squeezed the skimmel's middle, which made it bulge out of the top and bottom of his hand. Lots of fur, no bones, said Fleef. Girk set the skimmel onto my stomach. It walked up and took another look at my face, walked back to my stomach, turned around three times, and settled down with a sigh. After a moment, it began to make a noise, something like a window fan. It likes you, cried Fleef happily. I named the skimmel Murgatroyd. It kept me company through the following days as Croc turned my brain on and off while he examined it. I had a lot of visitors. They all seemed to like to squeeze the skimmel. Broxholm showed up almost every day, as did Fleef and Girk. Aliens I had never seen before stopped in to say hello. The crystal captain sent me a plant whose blossoms made singing noises that reminded me of my interview in the diamond chamber. And Hulan spent hours with me every day, telling me wonderful stories about the history of the galaxy. Every once in a while, he would look at me strangely and ask me questions about what had happened to me when I ha was having the operation. But Krug Dog was always there and wouldn't let him question me too sharply. Finally, the day came when Croc Doc was going to put my brain back in my head. Did you find what you needed? I asked, still feeling groggy and disconnected. His snout drooped down. Not yet, he said, but we're still analyzing the data. Don't don't despair, for don't despair, Krupta. All is not lost. And then he put me to sleep. When I woke up, the skimmel was whirring on my head, on my stomach and my brain was back in my head. Croc Doc was leaning over me, just as he had that first day, after he had put in the language implant. Am I all right? I whispered. With any luck, you'll be better than ever, he said. I opened and closed my eyes a few times, and looked around the room. My vision was sharp and clear. I'd stretched and realized that my hands were no longer tied down. Can I, can I stand up? I asked. No reason not to, said Croc Doc. Just take it easy. Why don't you come up here? Oh, I said, lifting Murgatroyd from my stomach to my shoulder. Murgatroyd snuggled in as I sat up and swung my legs over the edge of the table. Careful, said Croc Doc. I waited a moment before standing up, but I felt terrific. It was as if my brain had been wrapped in fog, and now the fog was gone. Croc Doc made a gesture that meant I put my hand beneath your grandmother's egg and told me how much he appreciated my help. You may come and talk to me any time you have about your, our findings, he said. I owe you that courtesy, at least. I gathered my things, the little gifts that aliens had brought me, squeezed Murgatroyd for luck, and prepared to return to my room. But when I stepped through the transcendental elevator, it spit me out into a place I had never seen before. That's the end of chapter 15. We'll see you next time for chapter 16. Make sure to like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon. And I'll see you next time.